Um, hey, everybody. So um, I'm from the University of Tennessee, Memphis, Tennessee, originally from Oak Ridge, which is um, near Knoxville. Um, so this was a 68-year-old Caucasian male with a history of primary open angle glaucoma and failed filtration surgery in the left eye. He presented to the emergency department on post-operative day five um, from an all-med glaucoma valve in the left eye and presented with acute vision loss and pain in that eye. Um, so his past medical history was significant for diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, um, a remote history of a meningioma. He had an ocular history of primary open angle glaucoma and cataracts in both eyes, as well as a surgical history of trabeculectomies and cataract extraction in both eyes. Um, his medications listed and his review of systems was negative for fever or chills. So on exam, he had a visual acuity of 2050 in the right and light perception in the left eye. His pupils were three to two millimeters in the right and 3.5 millimeters and minimally reactive with a positive APD in his left eye. Um, his pressures were um, 10 in the right and two in the left. Lids lacrimal um, and lashes were within normal limits. Um, the conjunctiva and sclera were um, showed flat and vascularized blood superiorly in both eyes as well as a well-covered Ahmed glaucoma valve in the left. Um, his conjunctiva was clear in the right um, and he had iris to cornea touch in the periphery of the left eye. The anterior chamber of the right eye was deep and quiet. Um, the left eye was shallow and again showed iris to cornea touch, but no lens to cornea touch. And there was, um, the tube from the valve was plugged by forward iris and there was a 25% hypema. Both irises had superior peripheral iridotomies um, and the lens, his lenses were posterior chamber IOLs in both eyes, and there was no view to the back on the left. Um, so before I continue, what would be your differential diagnosis? Okay, so this is a differential diagnosis just for a flat anterior chamber, and in our patient, um, he had a low intraocular pressure, but for the sake of the differential, um, someone presenting like this with high intraocular pressure, you would first want to see if there was a pupillary block. If there was, consider acute angle closure. Um, no pupillary block it could be aqueous misdirection syndrome, um, and then a postoperative patient, supraschoidal hemorrhage. Um, so low intraocular pressure could be overfiltration or a blood leak, um, probably most commonly um, in this type of post-operative patient. It could also be aqueous suppression, um, acute choroidal effusion, or annular ciliary body detachment. Um, so this is the image um, from the night he presented, and you can see a dome-shaped elevation, um, which is echolucent behind it, and there actually um, was an appositional dome-shaped elevation. It, you can't really see it from this picture. Um, but it was present. So he had a choroidal effusion. Um, so choroidal detachment is if you're complication of intraocular surgery, um, and it's the most common posterior segment complication of aqueous drainage surgery, and it's ge generally attributable to postoperative hypotenuse. So some other causes um, not surgically related are eye trauma, corneal ulcers, PRP, and the use of IOP lowering medications. Um, if it occurs idiopathically, it can be termed uveal effusion syndrome, um, which happens in healthy middle-aged males um, prototypically, and majority are bilateral. Um, if choroidal detachment occurs without any evidence of intraocular surgery or tra trauma, you would want to investigate neoplastic vascular inflammatory causes. Um, so choroidal detachment can either be serous or hemorrhagic, and they present um, somewhat differently. So um, serous effusions, can be asymptomatic or painless if they're small or peripheral. Um, larger effusions can cause a myopic, refract, myopic shift because of the anterior displacement of the lens. Um, there may be a reduction in visual acuity depending on the, its location and the proximity to the visual axis, and there may be a scotoma at the site of effusion. Um, Supercortal hemorrhage per, um, characteristically presents as sudden throbbing pain in the eye, headache, nausea, vomiting, marked reduction in visual acuity, um, and the visual outcome and overall prognosis is worse than a serous effusion. Um, so if you did 
were able to see the back, um, you can appreciate um, there's a dome-shaped elevation um, with trans illumination and fixed um, adherence to the vortex veins. And then superchoroidal hemorrhage um, would look similar without the trans illumination because of the blood. And then on B scan, um, similarly, you see a dome shaped elevation. Um, and this is a picture of a chordal effusion, so there's echo lucent um, behind it. And um, there, there's an hourglass configuration because of the firm attachments to the vortex veins. And then retinal detachments um, look different on B scan because um, they are mobile, um, whereas um, both types of chordal detachment are immobile. Um, so some of the pathogenesis um, of choroidal detachment, it's just an accumulation of serum or blood in the potential space between the choroid and the sclera. Um, Postoperatively, the most common cause is hypotony, um, and hypotony leading to um, serous effusion um, can be further exacerbated um, by um, the reduction in aqueous humor production if there's an annulary ciliary body detachment or if there's inflammation, those can further reduce aqueous humor production. And then serous effusion is thought to be caused by um, a pressure gradient that can occur in one of three ways. So um, hypotony, which is decreased extravascular pressure, um, increased venous pressure, so the increased capillary wall pressure, or ocular inflammation, which um, causes vascular permeability. And then suprachordal hemorrhage is thought to be caused by a rupture of the posterior ciliary arteries following chordal effusion. And this is just a schematic um, of the three causes, so hypotony, decreased interstitial pressure, and then you have pressure from the capillaries into the interstitium, um, increased capillary pressure, um, produces a similar um, effusion, and then inflammation causing vascular permeability. So this is just a list of um, predisposing factors. And then in our patient, um, the um, factors are highlighted. So any type of systemic disease that injures the vessels um, is the predisposing factor, um, glaucoma, and then probably the biggest factor for him was his recent intraocular surgery. Um, so some of the morbidities, um, lens opacities um, occur in a, in a significant proportion of patients um, who have choroidal detachment. Um, corneal endothelial damage can occur, especially if there's iris to cornea touch or lens to cornea touch, um, peripheral anterior sneaky eye, maculopathy, and globe kisses. Um, but interestingly, um, one study found that the success of the trabeculectomy wasn't affected by the choroidal detachment. Um, and then suprachoroidal hemorrhage is associated with a worse prognosis, and the prognosis really depends on the time point um, that the suprachoroidal hemorrhage occurs. So expulsive or intraoperative suprachoroidal hemorrhage um, is associated with a worse visual prognosis than delayed suprachoroidal hemorrhage. Um, so preventative measures, obviously, um, if the patient has hypertension or um, glaucoma, blood pressure and intraocular pressure control um, prior to surgery, discontinuation of anticoagulants and antiplatelets if possible. Um, and then intraoperatively, in patients undergoing trabeculectomy, um, there is a higher incidence of chordal detachment with the use of antifibrotics. So um, in patients with a lower risk of scarring, so primary trabeculectomy, if they have a thin conjunctiva, or the elderly, um, consider no fi antifibrotics or 5-FU only, um, but in patients who have a higher risk of scarring, mitomycin C is indicated. So the majority of patients can be treated medically and followed um, with topical corticosteroids and cycloplegic um, to um, posteriorly shift the lens iris diaphragm, um, but there are indications for surgical intervention, um, and these are the indications for suprachordal hemorrhage. So intractable pain, displacement of the vitreous into the anterior chamber, and car incarceration of the vitreous into the wound, and coexisting vi vitreous hemorrhage. And ideally, if you're performing surgery on a suprachordal hemorrhage, you would want to wait um, to allow the clot to liquefy or prior to draining, and you can follow this either with B-scan um, or it's thought that waiting seven to 10 days is enough time for this to happen. Um, but if the intraocular pressure is severely elevated, you may need to perform surgery immediately to relieve the compartment syndrome that's developing and prevent ischemic damage. 
Um, and then these are the indications for choroidal effusion um, surgical intervention. So retinal damage, um, oppositional choroidal effusions, or kissing choroidals, um, which we had in our patient. Um, so obviously you would want to intervene to prevent vitreous adhesions and eventual retinal detachments. Um, a flat in anterior chamber that leads to corneal damage. So if there's evidence of lens cornea touch or iris cornea touch, um, as we had, or endothelial corneal damage and acceleration of lens opacities, or the evidence of marked intraocular inflammation. And then finally, the last indication is just persistent choroidal detachment that fails to resolve. So sur surgical treatment, um, the first option, which can be performed at the slit lamp, is just um, anterior chamber reformation to kind of reverse the hypotony, so using the paracentesis and the injection of viscoelastic into the anterior chamber. Um, posterior sclerotomy also may be performed, so similarly pressur pressurizing the anterior chamber and then using the B scan um, to determine which quadrants had the largest diffusions, incisions are made, um, and full thickness cir circumferential incisions are made two millimeters long. Um, vitrectomy may be indicated for massive suprachoroidal hemorrhage or suprachoroidal hemorrhage with vitreous incarceration into the wound. And this is uh, just an image. And this is a video. Um, whoops. So the scleral flap has been made um, and the incision has been made and you can just see the serous fluid draining from the wound. So back to our patient, um, upon, upon further questioning, he admitted to straining earlier that day, so um, could have contributed um, to his acute effusion. Um, and he was taken back that night for posterior sclerotomies in the left eye, um, and serous fluid was drained from the wound. Um, on post-operative day one, this is his B-scan, so he still had oppositional choroidal effusions. He was started on Vigamox, continued on Predforte. He had a pressure of six and was still light for suction. On postoperative day three, he was still light for suction, still had some apposition. Um, so on postoperative day nine, um, he was taken back for repeat drainage from the same sclerotomy sites. Um, he had an intraocular pressure of 10 after injection of Yuan into the anterior chamber, and his visual acuity um, improved to 2400 and you can see some distance now. Um, on post-op day 15, um, he was light perception and um, his B-scan looked worse. So um, Keylon GV was injected into the anterior chamber and his pressure was brought from eight to 20. And then post-op day 17, um, his intraocular pressure improved to 15, visual acuity improved to 2200, um, was continued on cycloplegia, and this is from day 17 here. And then post-op day 24, his visual acuity improved to 2080. That's it. Any questions? Thank you. 
Um, I think the last time I heard was the 2080 vision, but he's continuing to follow up. It was um, like a m like a little over a month ago. So was that video of you showing the space station? It wasn't the space station. It was a different station. There wasn't a video of the space station. 